Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and I have with me today, Dr. Jeff Tompkins, ICR Director of Research and Geneticist. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Tompkins. It's awesome to be here. For all of our listeners and viewers, this is actually part two of a, of a two-part episode. You can make sure to please go watch part one so that all of this kind of makes sense. We are talking about humans and chimpanzees and the s- supposed similarities between them. Uh, so I recommend going back, watching that first. We'll still be here. All right. So Dr. Tompkins, last time we talked about human and chimpanzee genomes um, and how the number of 98.5% similar is not really that accurate. And I want to thank you for providing such an in-depth analysis of, of all of that information. Yeah. And so that kind of lays the groundwork for what I want to talk about today. But for yeah, sure. the genomes are, are no more than 84% similar. And I explained that in the previous episode. So and in fact, those numbers were confirmed by an evolutionist in, yes. in Europe. And so that would probably be the top argument for human evolution would be the DNA similarity or supposed DNA similarity between humans and chimps. But the second top argument is what I want to get into today. For sure, which is uh, the chromosome fusion issue. Uh, so... I have a very limited understanding of this topic, but if I do understand this correctly, uh, apes have an extra pair of chromosomes compared to humans, right? Right. And secular scientists say that some of those uh, chromosomes fused to uh, make the number that we have in humans, and that is supposedly proof of, of human evolution, right? Right. Well, let me give you a little background about why I actually began looking into this to begin for sure with. yeah Absolutely. so i was in my office probably about 11 years ago in here at icr and there was a couple an older couple that was coming through and visiting icr and they stopped by my office and they said uh, we have a son in college and he heard about this idea from an evolutionist about chromosome fusion between humans and chimps and he basically lost his faith over wow. it. He thought it was so compelling um, that he basically turned his back on God for all practical purposes. And I thought, wow, I better look into this in, in more detail and see what's going on. And of course, I didn't know what uh, I would actually find. Right. So I began looking into this idea of chromosome fusion myself and began looking at the literature, the DNA sequence. And I found that it really had no support at any level of the paradigm. And there's a number of facets to it, Mm -hmm. which go into it. And so that's what we'll talk about today. Awesome. Well, okay. Just so, so for our viewers and listeners, can you give them a more, uh, maybe in-depth idea of, of what the claim is here? You know, you hear chromosome fusion and this, this proves human evolution, but what, what are the, what are the secular scientists actually saying about this? The first so-called evidence for the fusion came before the days of DNA sequencing. Okay. Scientists were looking at images of human and chimpanzee chromosomes, and they're called karyotypes. And so you get a karyotype by basically isolating cells that are dividing and during mitosis. And the chromosomes are all scrunched up so that you can see the individual chromosomes. Right. Then you stain them with various stains, and these stains we now know basically highlight areas of, of differences in DNA letter concentrations of A's and T's and C's and G's, and they produce bands in these chromosomes. Well, these bands don't really correspond necessarily to genes or anything like that. They're just kind of a general banding pattern gotcha. up and down the chromosomes. Well, there was uh, several chimpanzee chromosomes that were very, had similar banding patterns to human chromosome 2. And, of course, there were bands that were not similar. In fact, there was actually an entire region of one of the chimpanzee chromosomes that was entirely missing in human chromosome 2, which was pretty significant. Right. But anyways, based on that, they claimed that 
two chimpanzee chromosomes that they now call 2A and 2B fused to form human chromosome 2. And this would account for the difference in chromosome numbers. So chimpanzees have 48 chromosomes, as do great apes in general, and humans have 46. Right. And so you get one set from your mother and one from your father. So anyways, they thought that human chromosome 2 was formed by this fusion of two smaller ape chromosomes called, they now call them 2A and 2B. And that was supposed to be the, the proof of human evolution. Right? right, and that was based on these early karyotype images from under a microscope. Okay. They, they were pretty, I mean, that's a pretty crude way to... Very basic. ...to go about things, right? That's what got the whole idea going to begin with. Well, in the early 1990s, when DNA sequencing was, was improving um, rapidly, they actually thought they found a region that represented the fusion site. Now, it was very small. It was only about 800 bases long. And when you have two chromosomes that would fuse together, you're going to have to have these areas on the ends connect to each other. Now, think about uh, shoelaces. You have that little plastic piece on the end right. of the shoelace that keeps it from unraveling. Well, chromosomes have these areas of TTA, GGG, those are the DNA letters, six, over and over and over again at the ends of the chromosomes. Kind of like to, to close it off. Right, to, to basically to form a structure at the end that, that would keep it stable and intact. Got it. It's actually more complex than that because you have this massive... Uh, D or DNA protein RNA complex at the at the end of chromosomes. It's called a sheltering complex, and it's it's actually this huge protein machine uh, that sits at the ends of chromosomes, not only acting as an end cap, but it interacts with the cell cycle and other features in the cell. So, but anyways, you have this DNA sequence at the end of chromosomes called it's a telomeric sequence. And in humans, that, those are 5,000 to 15,000 bases long. That's way more than 800. Exactly. So if you had two of those magically fused to each other, you would expect a signature that would be huge, 10,000 to 30,000 bases in length, not 800. But anyways, they did find this roughly 800 base long sequence that they thought represented a fusion because there was forward and reverse um, telomere sequences in there. The okay. DNA is double stranded, so TTA, GGG would have a complement okay. to it. So they, but the problem was that this 800 base fusion signature was very corrupt, very what evolutionists would say degenerate. So it was only if you actually had a real fusion that was say 800 bases long and it was pristine then you would expect, you know, a 99 to 100% pristine feature to that sequence. But actually, the, the fusion site is only 70% similar to what a real pristine fusion would be that would be 800 bases long. So mm -hmm. not only is it incredibly small, but it's very corrupt. But as I began looking into it, the, study, <laughs> the studies that I was doing got even more interesting. Right. Because it turns out that this 800 base sequence is in the middle of a gene. So okay. you don't have chromosomes fusing together and forming functional genes. In fact, it's a switch, or what we call a promoter, that controls and regulates this gene. So genes have multiple switches, multiple promoters. Some of them are directly in front of the gene. Some of them are just inside the gene, as is the case with what I'm going to just call the fusion site, just for lack of a better, <laughs> a, we'll better a better term, right? right. So this so-called fusion site is inside the gene. It functions as a promoter. It binds 12 different types of transcription factors, which are proteins that, that latch onto a gene and turn it off and on, tell it how fast to run, how much product to make, and so forth. Right. Not only that, but RNA polymerase II binds inside the fusion site and initiates transcription. 
So actually, the fusion site is an important switch inside a functional gene, and the gene is a long, non-coding RNA gene. And I actually trace the activity of this gene in the, in the public databases, and it's doing important stuff in a lot of different human tissues. And it's connected in networks to a lot of other important genes in your body as well. So much for the fusion site. Right. <laughs> Well, if you were to have two chromosomes fused together, not only should you have a, a fusion site signature that would realistically look like one, which this one doesn't, right. you would also have two centromeres. So centromeres are, if, if you were to look at scrunched up chromosomes again in a karyotype, you'd see this pinched off place and might be in the middle of the chromosome, it might be more towards one end or the other, but that's called a centromere. So centromeres are important places or attachment sites where the, the cell division apparatus can latch onto the chromosome af after it's been replicated and pull it apart from the daughter chromosome. Okay. So centromeres are very important to cell division, to cell stability, to a lot of different things. So if you had two small chromosomes fused together, you would have two centromeres. Well, that would be an extremely unstable situation to begin with. But let's say that actually happened. And so evolutionists have found what they claim is a cryptic or fossil centromere in human chromosome 2, or at least that's what they claim. So I was investigating the so-called cryptic or fossil centromere and I found out, first of all, that it was incredibly small compared to real human centromeres, okay. which are about 250,000 bases long on average. This particular signature was only about 41,000 bases long. And on top of that, it had interruptions in it that were not a centromeric-like sequence. Right. But even more interesting in debunking was that it itself also was inside a gene. In fact, it was inside a large protein coding gene, an anchor and repeat protein coding gene that would form a protein that would be some sort of a membrane bound receptor. So this protein, once it's created, would go to the cell membrane, part of it would stick out of the cell, part of it would stick inside the cell, and it would be some sort of a signal transducing protein. Obviously a very important protein right. for the cell. Well, here was the so-called centromeric signature of a fusion in the middle of a protein coding gene. Once again... Doesn't seem likely. <laughs> right. So, so once again, we have the two key signatures of fusion are in the middle of genes doing important things. In fact, part of the, the centromeric uh, signature actually codes, ends up coding for part of the protein itself. And so obviously the, the fusion site, the centromeric site are, are doing important things. They're parts of genes. There's no way that they could have come about by some sort of a mysterious fusion. Do evolutionists see, uh, or do we see in general, any fusion sites in nature? And are they similar to this supposed fusion site uh, for apes and humans? Well, that's a great question, because when they first discovered the fusion site in, in actual DNA data in the early 1990s, they were surprised at what they found, because it did not match up with what they see in nature. Okay. It, what they supposedly found in, in human chromosome 2 was a telomere-telomere fusion. But in nature, we just see either telomere satellite DNA fusions or satellite satellite DNA fusions. Okay. We do not see telomere telomere fusion. So satellite DNA is just this repetitive form of DNA where you can get breaks in, in the chromosome in those satellite DNA sites. Okay. And so we don't see telomere telomere fusions in nature. Now we do see them in in cancer cells that are dividing wildly and rapidly and out of control. Not the way Exactly. It's, it's, to. it's not a healthy situation, obviously. Right. So the telomere-telomere 
so-called signature in human chromosome number two never occurs in nature. Well, awesome. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, so I do have, you, you had mentioned the, the college student um, earlier. Do you have any advice or encouragement for someone who might be going into a situation where they're encountering a lot of this like evolutionary thought um, and just something to encourage them uh, it, to maybe encourage their faith in particular? So. Well, exactly. Well, it depends on where they are, you know, scientifically in their life. Maybe it's a biology student or a genetic student or something that's heard this argument. Right. And then I would say, well, go to the material that we have, which you'll you'll promote here at the end of this yes, sir. this discussion. But really, the bottom line is the so-called signatures of fusion, the so-called fusion site, the so-called cryptic centromeric side are functional features inside active genes. They are not some product of a catastrophe where the chromosome fused end to end magically. These signatures are functional features inside genes. And, and really, when you look at all the data surrounding fusion, it does not support it. It really looks like what we see here is design, not you know evolution from an ape to a human. And design is what we would expect to see if, oh, we, exactly. were, if we were created in the image of a loving God. Exactly. These so-called you know sites that supposedly re- represent an accident, you know, happening out there with chromosomes fusing, they, they're when you look at them, you see design, you see active functional features inside genes. Mm-hmm not the remnants of some major chromosomal catastrophe. That's awesome. And it really does. It really does point to uh, point to a loving creator. And do you have any like closing thoughts on the subject? Anything you want to share with our audience before we, uh, before we close this? Yeah. Um, I think the, the most important thing regarding this issue is, is to study the material that we have here at ICR. For sure. You know, it is highly technical. It can be difficult to to relate this whole scenario to people, and so just uh, just do your homework. We have good material on this that uh, that will help you do that. We do, and uh, I'll actually share that with our uh, audience and viewers now. So we do have a uh, Creation Basics and Beyond. This is a great book. It covers so many topics. I've read it from cover to cover. Uh, and if you have any any questions about about creation science, uh, it's it's a great look into uh, some of the more in depth topics that you might want to talk about. Uh, there is a chapter on here uh, in in here about the fusion issue. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so there's a great chapter in here, and then uh, we do have, and it was written by you that chapter. <laughs> so. Uh, and then we do also have this book. Uh, we have Chimps and Humans, also written by you, Dr. Tompkins. Uh, another great deep dive. And it also covers the genome issue, which we talked about in our last episode as well. Uh, so anything you want to say about the book? Yeah, really, I cover the the human uh, chimpanzee evolution issue from every facet that you can think of. The DNA similarity paradigm, the chromosome fusion issue, pseudo genes in other uh, important areas as well awesome well of course uh to our viewers and listeners you can uh, pick this book up at icr.org store or if you visit our discovery center in dallas texas you can always pick up a copy there uh, thank you so much for being here dr Tompkins. it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you it's been great And to all of our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, You can, of course, find this podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends. Uh, It's very important, as we've seen, that this can be very encouraging to someone's faith. And there are all sorts of worldviews, false worldviews that we are kind of bombarded with. And this can uh, help bolster your faith. So I'm Trey. And we'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast.